night. These people are handling deadly snakes and living to tell about it. I understood that I was in over my head. What paranormal powers do they possess? Some claim this place is a doorway to other dimensions. We saw this spaceship. Are these photographs and exclusive footage proof of another world? This man's a real-life Ghostbuster. All of a sudden, the lower cabin door slammed open, a pan came flying out. Witness his extraordinary paranormal experiences. A bloody trail of cattle mutilations has bewildered these ranchers. You have certain body parts removed. Are aliens responsible for these gruesome slaughters? She journeyed to the other side to save her best friend's life. I said, Tracy, I said, I know, I saw you. I said, it was so real, it's like I could, I could touch you. Meet the Soul Sisters. And our psychic detectives unravel the mystery of this woman's disappearance. I don't see her having a left on her own at all. On the paranormal borderline. Hello, I'm Jonathan Frakes. How far would you go to prove your faith? Would you risk death every week? Would you drink poisonous liquids? Would you handle deadly snakes with your bare hands? We found some people who did. It's Saturday evening in Kingston, Georgia, a quiet country hamlet where the only sounds come from the crickets and frogs and from a little church on the edge of town. But this is not your typical church. Before the night is over, one man will fall victim to the bite of a deadly snake. All during the week, I pray, when I pray, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, don't let nobody get snake bit and hurt. Don't let nobody get snake bit and die. The Bible says in the 16th chapter of St. Mark's, in my name they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. For this congregation, handling lethal snakes and drinking deadly poison are the bizarre rituals by which members test their faith. We got some strychnine here, and one gulf of it would kill you. And all you had to do is take one swallow, is all you'd have to take. There are no doctors, ambulances, or antidotes on hand. And as the Reverend Carl Porter prepares his weekly sermon, it's clear that his plans are just a little bit different. We've got about uh, four copperheads here in this uh, aquarium here. And there's uh, two copperheads and a rattlesnake there. And down here we've got a, this is a cottonmouth, which you call it a cottonmouth water moccasin. This is what I transfer them to in the church, the church and these wooden crates. I'm not no supernatural person, but I'm serving a supernatural God. I'm as afraid of snakes as anybody else. Despite that fear, Carl Porter and believers from as far as 200 miles away gather at the Church of Jesus Christ. Once the service begins, there's no turning back. Well, I'm on my way. Well, I'm on my way. For almost 100 years, church members have been practicing these deadly rituals. In fact, more than 70 people have died as a result of snake bites. So why do they keep coming back? Hey, I find happiness in this. Love, peace. The first step towards snake handling takes place during the high-energy church service. Here, members experience something they call anointing, when the spirit descends upon them and takes them to a higher state place where they become invincible to the dangers of snakes and poison. My life, before I got involved with uh, handling the serpents, there's no sin that I didn't participate in. The very first time when I handled a serpent, I just walked up on the podium and took one of the rattlesnakes out of one of the brother's hands. And as I picked that snake up, this was a high that you could not, it's just, you couldn't describe it. I still have that high. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. I don't care if you've been high on marijuana. I don't care if you've been drunk on alcohol. This year feels 100 times 
thousand, hundred thousand, thousands of times better than anything that you can even imagine that you fail. But even if they are anointed, snake handlers still get bitten. Tonight, Junior McCormick falls victim to the fangs of an angry cop. The bite is deep and full of venom. McCormick is in grave danger, but there will be no trip to the hospital or medical attention given. McCormick and other church members believe the power of faith alone will pull him through. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. His hand puffs to twice its normal size. But soon, he is back on his feet, singing, preaching, and dancing. Have the members of this church tapped into something paranormal? Dennis Covington is a professor at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, an author and a journalist while working as a writer for the New York Times, he first encountered the snake handlers in 1991. When I was first assigned the story, I thought that the practice must be crazy. And when I met the people who were members of his church, I came to understand that they were sincere in their beliefs. And the moment I went to the church for the first time and actually saw the practice, I was very moved by it. Covington devoted two years of his life writing a book about the handlers. Then, to his amazement, he became a snake handler himself. I fell under a very heavy anointing of the Holy Spirit. I went to the front and took a large timber rattlesnake from Brother Carl's hands, held it aloft. I felt a total loss of identity. Covington felt the call to handle snakes twice in the two years he spent with the handlers. Then late one night, he realized he was going too far. I was lying in bed, it was midnight. I was listening to the sounds of my household, the breathing of my children in the next room, my wife beside me. And I, I understood that I was in over my head with the handlers. Others like Junior McCormick plan to remain with the church forever, even if it kills them. It thaws a little bit, but I'm not sick. I'm ready to go home, drive home, and they don't hurt me. I'm gonna be all right. <laughs> it didn't hurt my spirit. Just kind of bruised the old flesh a little bit. A word of caution for all of our viewers, and if it seems obvious, so be it. Handling snakes and drinking poison can and will kill you. Don't do it. We'll be right back. Coming up next, exclusive UFO footage from the place they call Galactic Park. And right above the bush was a pulsating ball of light. And later, a man who takes his ghost busting very seriously. I've been grabbed, slapped, pushed. Then, a deadly string of cattle mutilations has terrorized these ranchers. Something that can't be explained. And the remarkable story of a woman who went to the spirit world to rescue her friend. We've always had like a karmic cosmic bond, if you will. Linda Bradshaw's family ranch in Sedona, Arizona seems pretty typical at first glance. They've got horses, rustic buildings, and great desert views. Oh, and they say there's one more thing. They also have a portal to another dimension. I've been in this country for 50 years, and I finally saw something that, that proved that there was UFOs and spaceships. I was awestruck. Uh, once I overcame the shock, I grabbed my camera because I wanted to photograph it. What's uh, unusual about this place is, uh, is the fact that there's such a concentration of this type of phenomena, of, of the frequency of it, the variety of it that's going on here. In many ways, the Bradshaw Ranch is like any other ranch near Sedona, Arizona, but it's also becoming known as a center of unexplained phenomena, and perhaps a window to other worlds. What you are seeing is videotape footage of a UFO shot at the Bradshaw Ranch on a typical night. It is for this reason that the ranch is taking on a new name, Galactic Park. 
we saw this spaceship almost immediately, 40 or 50 balls of light come fast. They were traveling fast down that hillside and right into the ranch. It was a, really a spectacular thing to see. <laughs> For Bob Bradshaw and his wife, Linda, it all started when they began witnessing strange phenomena that neither could explain. I saw some really incredible things. Um, I saw a red ball of light shoot straight into the sky and shoot out. Um, I uh, saw UFOs. And while I was photographing all of this, I sensed something behind me. And I turned around, and right above the bush was a pulsating ball of light, and it was beamed right at me. When Linda first told her son, Victor, he was skeptical. I would tell him, these things are out there, and he used to tease me. He would come into my home humming the Twilight Zone theme to give me a hard time. But now Victor is a believer. While hiking near the property one day, he witnessed and recorded strange phenomena with his video camera. I'm very familiar with the territory and the animals in this area, and I'd see some animals that I've never known to exist. The Bradshaws started capturing so many unexplainable images. They called in internationally known author and UFO researcher Tom Dongo. He's co-written a book about the paranormal activity of the area. I uh, got my camera out and took some photographs, uh, random photographs. These are random photographs in any direction. And I got uh, some of the same sort of thing, but different. Uh, what I got was different from what Linda got. Linda shot a strange photograph that appeared to her to be an enormous movie screen in the sky. A huge, brilliant light showed up in the sky. It was octangular. I got two frames before it flicked back out again. All I could see with my eye was the light, but when I picked up the photograph, there was a picture of another place. It showed a, a ship flying through the air, telephone pole, there are no telephone poles here. It almost looks like it might be on the shore of an ocean. And there was a humanoid in the far left corner. We feel that this is indicative of showing us that there is another dimension right here. There is a connection. There is an opening. On Bob and Linda's invitation, we sent a camera crew to Bradshaw Ranch to see for ourselves. Our night vision cameras did capture something we can't explain. A strange strobing light that amazed the Bradshaws and our crew. Here's one right Yep, there. we've got one of the major ones right on the there. right with the gold. Yep. yep. And that one just popped right up, didn't it? Yep. 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 And it's still there. And okay, I'm going to go to the doubler, so it's I'm going to increase the magnification. Oh, it looks like it's It seems like it's very slow. Oh, it's these strange UFOs may seem fantastic, but Tom Dongo says they are familiar visitors to the ranch and can be seen almost nightly. Well, that's that's one of them. They, now it'll probably blink out in a second, but you'll notice it's almost it's almost not moving, and it's going to get it'll get dimmer and brighter and dimmer and brighter. Very very odd phenomena. Just popped right out. One evening, Tom took the spotlight and flashed three times. It flashed back at us three times. At that point, we knew that there was an intelligence. What are these unexplainable sightings? And why does it happen so frequently here near Sedona? Could there be a stargate or portal to other dimensions? According to UFO researchers like Brian Myers, the answer may be found in science. Well, the scientific community has done a lot of research on dimensions. They have established that there are multiple dimensions existing in the same space. Now, why certain areas are like bleed-through areas, emerging points, or what people are calling portals, you know, we don't know that. Sedona, for centuries thought to be a mystical place, a sacred location where strange and inexplicable things happen. Now, photographic evidence seems to support these legends, and thanks to a special agreement, the Bradshaw Ranch will soon be a research site on multiple dimensions and UFOs. Coming up next, a mother's desperate plea puts our psychics on the case of a missing daughter. Do any of you think that she's alive? And when this woman discovered her house was haunted... I started to hear footsteps upstairs. She called a real-life Ghostbuster. 
And later, what is the deadly mystery behind one town's bizarre cattle mutilations? The instrument being used is in excess of 300 degrees. And a story of friendship that went beyond this world. I could not find my way back to my own body. Before we get to this week's psychic detective case, we have an update on a previous case. Recently, our panel of psychic detectives took on the case of Catherine Sue. In that case, Sue was convicted of the brutal murder of successful businessman Robert O'Debane. But before her arrest, she fled police and went into hiding. Now, thanks to viewers like you and accurate leads from the psychics, Catherine Sue is in custody. I'd like to announce, as you all may know, the arrest of Catherine Sue, who is wanted on a federal fugitive warrant for an awful flight to avoid confinement. In our program, the psychic detectives identified Sue's location in South Florida, her connection to a family in Miami, and the fact that she was close to striking again. According to Chicago police detective Bill Johnston, the psychics were right on several counts. Sue was carrying a Florida state driver's license. She told people her parents were wealthy Miami residents. And perhaps most chilling of all, she was in the process of targeting a Honolulu businessman. Not anymore. Catherine Sue is currently facing extradition to Chicago for sentencing in the murder of Robert O'Debane. Each week, we bring together one tough unsolved crime and three of the world's top psychic investigators. Tonight, it's the case of a young nurse who disappeared after making a trip to the cash machine. Police have reached a dead end. Reporter Yolanda Gaskins has more. Thanks, Jonathan. Melissa Sloan was young, beautiful, and loved her job working with the elderly. She was last seen making a routine cash withdrawal from an ATM machine in Orlando, Florida. After that, nothing. Melissa Sloan was happiest when she was helping those less fortunate. Her passion led her into the nursing field, where her good cheer and determination were highly valued. Merle Brady, Melissa's mother, remembers her daughter. She's very energetic. She's a hard worker. She was goal-oriented. And if she wanted something, she would work for it and, and reach that goal. On May 1st, 1994, Melissa Sloan vanished without a trace from the apartment she shared with her husband. The last images of Melissa alive were recorded by this ATM security camera in downtown Orlando. Detective Barbara Bergen has been tracking the mystery for nearly two years. The last time that we have Melissa Sloan documented as being alive was on May 1st at this ATM when she came here and withdrew $10 and it was captured on video. When relatives called in the police, the lack of evidence made Melissa's disappearance seem even more bizarre. When we had uniformed officers go to the house and the residence, they found not any articles of women's clothing or anything to indicate that she'd even lived there at the time. Um, and there were no other leads to follow up on. We did an immediate search of the apartment area, the neighbors, the apartment itself, spoke to the husband. Um, then we branched out because we ran out of leads. The police continue to hold out hope that Melissa is lost but alive. But where and why no contact for almost two years? We walked through the fields into the swamps, um, basically we have run out of leads. Um, and we're hoping that the psychics can provide us with new ones. Before we begin, I have to stress that the information you've just viewed has not been seen by the psychics. The psychic detectives are Nancy Meyer, Kathleen Ray, and Greta Alexander. Also with us in studio are Orlando homicide detective Barbara Bergen, Melissa's sister Michelle Walker, and Melissa's mother Merle Brady. Let's begin. Greta, you want to get started? She was kind of a determined little girl. <laughs> Very much. Yeah, no, <laughs> just this short of being bullheaded, really. Her profession, her nursing profession, was extremely important to her. Very nice. I mean, even almost more than her home. Um, I feel like that she was thinking about separating, making a change in her home here, and that she had communicated with you guys about she was going to be separating from him. Was there, is there some of her clothing missing? All of her clothing is missing. Do you feel like she left the state of Florida? I don't think she ever got out of Florida. 
She's still in the Orlando vicinity. Not too far away. Was she the one who packed her clothes? I I don't think that. I I, I just um, I think her clothes were packed with her, but for her. All right, thank you. Let's go into Nancy. I find this photo at the bank quite interesting because I am feeling a lot of anger in her and a lot of hurt at the time this photo is taken. I have the feeling that she had discovered something that she has suspected for a long time. And I have the feeling that on the day this photo was taken, she had somehow proven it to her own satisfaction. I feel uh, very, a great deal of uh, mental confusion for all this nice, seemingly uh, gentle exterior. Her home life was an extremely difficult situation. I don't see her having a left on her own at all. And I see her having been wrapped in uh, an old shower curtain. And I see her having been carried um, to the back of a vehicle that looks like the hatch in the back goes up. And it's a dark green or black vehicle. And I see that vehicle having some connection with a woman. And you're headed towards what is a recreational area that's closed at the time this happened. Her remains were left inside this recreational area. It also seems to be an area that both the people that took her body there are very, very familiar with. And I also feel that that young woman continued in a relationship with this man, and I have a feeling that she knows quite a bit about what happened and could give you pretty exact location, but I don't think she's quite ready to talk to you yet. Do any of you think that she's alive? I don't know. Well, she's too humanitarian not to let her family know. She wouldn't put you through this. No, so not absolutely not. not. Absolutely. She's not a cruel person. There's not a cruel no. bone in her body. And to put you through what you've been through yeah. without calling you is too cruel. No, I agree. She would have called. She would have been in contact yeah. in some way. And she was not a person lacking in courage. You know, she was a very courageous young woman. And, you know, she felt she, I think, I think the biggest mistake she made was in trying to handle everything herself and not asking for help sooner. In the session, the psychics continued to provide information. When we followed up with Detective Barbara Bergen back in Orlando, a new search was already underway. It's somewhat surprising, you know, that they could get all those things as accurate as they did. They mentioned the fact that all of her clothes were missing. The problems at home are consistent with everything that we have found. One of the things that they mentioned was the possibility that a second person could be involved. And that's something that we hadn't looked at in the past and we need to look at. Um, a recreation area. We need to try and find a recreation area that's consistent with what they're saying and see if we can look there. Um, and the fact that all three of them said that she had been murdered and that the body had been dumped somewhere, and that's what we suspected. Finding it may be a different problem. As new searches are conducted and new leads are sorted out, Melissa's mother continues to wait. I want to find out who did it and where she is. But like I said, as a mother, I cannot give up hope. If you ever saw the movie Ghostbusters, you've seen the comic side of the paranormal. But real life ghost research is a deadly serious business. Just ask Kerry Gaynor. Kerry Gaynor is a man who has been attacked by spirits. He's seen horrific apparitions. He has literally felt death. But this is what he lives for. And I've been grabbed, slapped, pushed. So there have certainly been moments when my adrenaline was going through the roof, but it doesn't make me want to leave and not come back. It just makes me more interested. Kerry Gaynor is a real-life ghost hunter. He's never charged a fee for the work he's done on over 900 cases. What drives him 
is a need to understand a mystery beyond understanding. This is the ultimate mystery to me. This is something that I believe will, gives me an opportunity to learn something extraordinary, something that will tell us a great deal more about what happens after death, something that will tell us a great deal more about personal identity, about who we really are, what we are. When did you move in here? I moved in this house uh, mid-October 95. And how long after that did you start hearing these footsteps? I would say a month after that, yeah. Carrie began investigating ghosts in the early 70s at UCLA's Neuropsychiatric Institute, then a renowned center of paranormal investigation. In this case, Marin Ferrari is scared by the erratic noises and lights that come into her 90-year-old house late at night. I really wear two hats. I go in there to investigate the phenomena to try to determine whether it's real or not. But I also go in there to help the people living in the environment so that they can get a better perspective on what they're experiencing and deal with it more effectively. Okay, what was the next thing that happened? So I just went into bed and I turned all the light down and um, five minutes after that, I started to hear footsteps upstairs, the top of my bedroom. And then when I heard these footsteps, the light went on a bit more brighter and this noise was really close and then the light went even brighter. So then I really started to think really something was happening. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I didn't move at all. I was scared. Kerry conducted his best known investigation when he was still a student. It began with a chance meeting in a bookstore. A nervous woman told him her house was haunted and asked for help. The case would prove almost too much for him to handle. When we interviewed her, she told us a lot of fascinating paranormal happenings in her house. But she was holding back, and I knew she was holding back. So I kept pressing her and pushing her, and finally, she said to me that she was raped and beaten by the ghost. The story was interesting, but far-fetched. She described two small ones. One would hold down her ankles, the other would hold her neck, and a third one would attack her. She had bite marks on her neck, bite marks on her breast, black and blue marks all over her body. She was absolutely, unequivocally beaten up. Kerry and his partner left the interview doubtful about the woman's credibility. She had no evidence that ghosts had attacked her. But that changed when she called to say others were being attacked in her house, including her four children. So we went back there. And this time we took two cameras with us, a Polaroid and a regular 35 millimeter camera. Kerry's investigation took him into the kitchen. All of a sudden, a lower cabinet door slammed open, a pan came flying out. And this was my introduction, essentially, to the case. I immediately tore the cabinet apart to see if there were any little midgets in there throwing things at me or some kind of device that they had rigged up. There was nothing that I could see. The entity seemed to be everywhere. A few moments later, the lady screams out, it's in my bedroom. So we go running into her bedroom. She goes, it's over there. We fire the Polaroid at this point and the picture comes out bleached out white completely. She shouts out again, it's over there, the picture comes out bleached out white again. Now at that point, I didn't think we had anything, I just thought the camera was malfunctioning. So I said to her, I want to take two control pictures. Now control pictures are pictures where the environment is supposedly normal. So I asked her, is it, is it gone? And she said, yeah, it's gone. I took two control pictures, they were perfectly normal pictures. That night, he began a 10-week investigation that became the most well-documented haunting case in history. We decided this was a case worth investigating. So we brought in more cameras, we brought in more people, we brought in psychics, and we set up shop. Thousands of photos were taken, but only a few showed evidence of the dancing lights that investigators witnessed every night. This was a show. I mean, this would last for up to a minute. And we were all observing it at the same time, sometimes 10, 15 people at once. After 10 weeks, the family moved from the house and the hauntings tapered off. Later, the case became the basis for a book and a movie, both entitled The Entity. It was a case in which Carrie wasn't able to help the haunting victim as much as he would have liked. But in many cases, he is able to help. It's very nice to be able to help them return to a normal way of living and functioning in the world. I wish I could do it more often. Every new case is a potential solution to the puzzle. Well, when you hear the footsteps, do you think you can just kind of look at it as a curiosity as opposed to something to be frightened of? Well, I mean, it's difficult for me to control, you know, my feelings about it, but it was a combination of the two. It was a combination of being scared and also being totally fascinated. So maybe the next time I will just, like, move forward and maybe being less scared and try to understand better what's going on. Well, it may turn out to be just a great mystery for you, something yeah. you'll be fascinated by. 
and not concerned about it all, just fascinated by it. No matter what happens, Carrie will never give up. I'm going to pursue it for the rest of my life because I think there's something here very telling, something that can really allow us to grow and evolve to, to a much deeper understanding of who and what we are. According to a Roper organization poll, more than 30 million Americans claim to have seen, heard, or felt a ghost. It appears Carrie Gaynor will never be short of work. Coming up next, is the mutilation of these cattle really an alien cover-up? I think the government knows about the mutilation. I think they know exactly what's going on. And later, a spiritual bond miraculously brings a woman back from the brink. I was concerned that she was going to die. Meet the Soul Sisters. Tim and Lisa Howard make a good argument for believing in the paranormal. Why? Because they're skeptics. There's no way they'd think aliens were swooping down at night to perform experiments on their cattle. That was before July of 1995. They're not skeptics anymore. I thought it was kind of weird because everything else was, had frost on it. And uh, she didn't, and she was still pretty hot. So she knew she hadn't been dead for a long time. There was no tracks, no predators. I mean, it was, it was too perfect. I guess we kind of looked for an explanation because it was weird, you know. It was something that we hadn't seen before. Klamath Falls, Oregon is a quiet rural farm and ranch community where the people take their cattle ranching very seriously. Tim Howard has been ranching for close to 40 years and is well respected in the area. But late last year, the Howard family found one of their herd dead in a bitter afternoon frost. There was nothing unusual about the calf's death until the Howard's son, 12-year-old Heath, took a closer look. Her left eye was gone and left ear. And uh, her tongue was cut off at the teeth when we just found her. Well, I drove up and the boys were headed back and I asked them if everything went all right. They said, yeah, but they had a dead cow down there, a dead heifer, so I drove down there and looked. Heath's friend had recently read an article about cattle mutilations and said their calf looked very much like what the article had described. When Cody told me about this article about these cow mutilations, I didn't believe him. I didn't think that it ever happened to us or something. And I went up there and got that article and read it, and then me and the neighbor went back and looked again. I'll be damned if it wasn't like it was in the magazine. Roy Myers is an investigator for the Mutual UFO Network, an organization which explores paranormal phenomena. According to Myers, the Howard's cow was a textbook mutilation. This is a, a near classic case. Uh, you have certain body parts removed. In most of these cases, the cows are laying on the right side, uh, no tracks, and the lack of blood at the scene. The bizarre way in which the animal was killed simply has no logical explanation. The Howards are certainly troubled by the loss of one of their livestock, but they are more troubled by the question the killing raises. The Howards reported the incident to the local game warden. Like most cattle mutilation reports, it was passed off as a predator kill. But Tim Howard and his family say this is no earthly predator they know of. About the only predator in this area is a coyote, you know. And if a coyote killed her, he'd have had her ate up. He'd have had the cow ate up pretty good. And that cow wasn't ate up, it was cut up. I don't think they really want to get involved in something that can't be explained. So they're just going to give you an explanation and call it good and be on their way. We can immediately rule out the predator theory because there's no, there's no blood at the scene. And the extraction of the tissue and the teats and everything else is just too, too neat. No tracks, no physical evidence, no witnesses. Just a lot of unanswered questions. It is Roy Meyer's quest to find answers. The tests are revealing to us that there is, in fact, a, a change at a cellular level, and the instrument being used is in excess of 300 degrees. That looks like, you know, burnt flesh. It's hot enough to melt hemoglobin. It has been speculated that a laser may have been used. But the only problem we have with that is if you use a laser, there is going to be carbon residue left. And in all the cases examined, there has been no carbon residue. 
Local reporter Gene Billardu has been investigating paranormal activity in the Oregon area for the past five years. She says there have been 10 mutilations in the region in the last year, and the numbers are growing. I talked to one rancher last night that lost six in one night. And at about $1,000 a head, that can take your profit right away. According to Gene, two months before the Howard mutilation, Bill and Gene Barton, 300 miles away in Red Bluff, California, found two of their own cows mutilated in the same fashion as the Howards. Well, other ranchers that it has happened to them uh, do not talk about it because they're ridiculed by the law enforcement officers. The reason why Bill and I went public was because it was a big financial loss for us, and we wanted to know why our cows died. The only clue to these high-tech mutilations came from the Barton's neighbor and fellow rancher, Phil Leroy. While walking his dogs late one night, he saw three black helicopters silently hovering over the field where the Bartons later found their mutilated calves. They were flying in a 12-4 formation, standard military type formation. After they hung there for the amount of time they did, they nosed down and took off south like they were shot out of a gun. I think the government knows about the mutilation. I think they know exactly what's going on, but they're afraid to tell the public. What, if anything, do the black helicopters have to do with these horrifying cattle mutilations? Are the Bartons and the Howards just random victims? Are the mutilations part of a top secret medical experiment? Or is it a high-tech UFO encounter? Meanwhile, the killings continue and one thing is clear. There is no rational explanation. When you eliminate some of the obvious things that they are not, as predator kills or a Satanist, then you're left with things that are a little bit more bizarre. A lot of people talk about the cults, if it's a cult, that have uh, come and cut parts off and things like that. But uh, and you wonder, well, you know, how'd they get, get the cow to die? You just can't walk up to it and say, you know, die cow when it falls over. It's pretty hard to get a 1,200-pound animal to lay down while you cut her up. You know, that's... I don't know. I just... It's pretty weird. Cattle mutilation stories have been with us for the past 20-some years. And I, I just don't get it. Why would vastly superior beings capable of interstellar travel fly to this planet and mess around with our cows? We'll be right back. Coming up next, a woman went to the other side. I remember the first thing I saw was the entrance to a tunnel. And the friend who brought her back. I had this dream, and I was telling her that I needed her. What special bond do they possess? Relive the near-death experience and miraculous rescue. How tight is the bond of friendship? Can it extend beyond death? In our next story, we have two friends. When one died, the other crossed the borderline to save her. Not just once, but twice. Carrie Wood and Tracy McCallan met when they were 11 years old and instantly became best friends. A unique and mysterious bond formed between them that remains to this day. We call each other soul sisters. Um, we've always had like a karmic cosmic bond, if you will. We communicate a lot without really speaking, you know? We don't really have to say a whole lot. That's always been kind of strange. We always know when we, one of us is feeling bad, whether it be just an emotional depression, a, a physical ailment. Several years ago, Carrie and Tracy found out just how strong the bond between them was when Carrie was rushed to the hospital with severe chest pains. And it felt like somebody had, was stacking bricks one by one on top of my chest. Incredibly, at the same moment Carrie was in the hospital experiencing chest pains, her best friend Tracy, miles away, began gasping for breath. For no reason. I, I didn't feel good at all. I didn't really know what was wrong with me. I couldn't breathe. I was like hyperventilating. I flatlined at that point. And then I passed out. I dropped 
Was Tracy's collapsing at home some kind of paranormal response to Carrie's flatlining at the hospital? I believe that when I collapsed, it corresponded directly with her. I collapsed because she collapsed. It was too close in time. Carrie was in a coma for six weeks while her condition declined daily. Carrie was admitted with a viral pneumonia. It progressed into respiratory distress and then respiratory failure. And we literally did not expect her to survive. Her life with Robert Froelich and their two sons was in serious jeopardy. Yeah, they told us that uh, they didn't expect her to live and that, you know, their chances were 5%. And uh, those aren't good odds. As the days passed with no improvement, everyone began losing hope, especially Carrie's mother. I just felt like the whole bottom had fallen out, that everything had been done that could be done, and there just wasn't anything else to do. Well, I was feeling very sad, knowing that there's children involved, and that, you know, I, you don't want to lose someone you love. Tracy was at Carrie's bedside day and night. The thought of losing her soulmate was both frightening and painful. I was concerned that she was going to die, and um, she was so young, and I was concerned that I was going to lose my best friend. After a long and difficult battle, Carrie faced death once again. But this time, Tracy was there to help her. I remember closing my eyes, and just like I was going to sleep, so I was very, very tired. And then uh, my heart stopped. I flatlined again. But even near death, Carrie was not far away from the cosmic connection between her and her best friend. I remember the first thing I saw was the entrance to a tunnel. I didn't actually see it. I just was like, like a magnet drawn to it. Um, I went through this tunnel, just sucked. Uh, that's the only way I can describe it, sucked right through it. I was in limbo. I was trapped. I we could not find my way back to my own body. Carrie was at the brink of death, but Tracy was there to rescue her. The next thing, I was at my best friend Tracy's house. I remember uh, entering uh, through her door, literally, and sat at the edge of her bed, the foot of her bed, and she was, um, she was laying down, and I said, Tracy, wake up. While Carrie was having her near-death experience at the hospital, Tracy was at home, asleep, sharing the same vision. I had this dream that she came to my house. It was very strange, and it was really real. It was like she was sitting on the end of my bed, and I was telling her that I needed her. She couldn't leave me. She said, you can't leave me now. I just said, don't go, like she was going somewhere. And then I opened my eyes and there was still all the hustle and bustle around me. Carrie regained consciousness and began a full recovery. It was only later that both friends realized they had actually met each other on the other side. Months later, after I was uh, already uh, at discharged from the hospital, she, I told her, I said, Tracy, I said, I know I saw you. I said, it was so real, it's like I could, I could touch you. When we started putting the facts together, it was a little scary. And the notes were just like parallel matching, kind of spooky. I owe a lot to Tracy in a lot of ways. Her helping me come back or convincing me come, to come back, the fact that even though I was nearly gone, she was still not going to let me go. Without a doubt, I attribute that to the soul sisterhood that we share. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time as we continue to present some of the world's most fascinating stories. I'm Jonathan Frakes. Good night.